866. Number 866. I will call on the This evening's scripture reading will come from Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. That's Matthew 18, 10 through 14. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven there are, their angels do always behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye? If a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is astray? And if so, be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he, rejoiced, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which, which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish." Let's pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace and mercy, praising you and desiring, Father, this evening to worship you in the way that you desire us to worship. We pray, Father, that all that we do would be in accordance with your word, that we deviate neither to the left nor to the right, but that we hold you up and honor you and praise you by our obedience to you. Father, we pray that you be with us this week as we're busy working in your kingdom. We pray, Father, that providentially you would lead us to those that are searching for the truth. We pray that we might teach them the truth in love. We pray for a growth in your kingdom, especially in this place as the elders lay before us a, a challenge to reach out to the lost. And we pray that we can find that lost sheep and bring it to the fold. We're thankful for Jesus and what he means to us, his life, his death on the cross. We're thankful for that hope of eternal salvation we can gain by being obedient to you. Be with us, Father. We're looking forward to that time when we can serve you throughout all eternity. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Number 154 is in the first, second, and last. If you would please stand. Number 154. <clears throat> Give me the Bible. I suppose of all the songs that could precede the preaching of God's Word, that one uh, is most appropriate, and that's what we strive to do here uh, each time that we are together for worship 
And certainly as we open the Word of God together, it is my desire and that of the other men, and certainly under the endorsement and watchful eye of our elders, that uh, we give you the Bible. And we give you nothing uh, more than that. Uh, just the facts. The old TV detective wanted, wasn't it? I think uh, Sergeant Friday or whatever his name was. Well, uh, we want to give you those facts from the Word of God. And tonight, I want you to do that or make sure that I'm doing that. And so I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open. If you're at home and following along, then certainly uh, do that as well. Uh, you may be in a more comfortable chair than some of the folks that are here in the auditorium. Uh, but don't allow that comfort maybe to uh, cause you to be dull to the hearing of the Word of God. Let's uh, listen to it as we look. If you can see the screen, uh, another question and answer session. We've had a little bit of a break all the way back in November. Uh, that was the time that my uh, mother fell victim to the COVID-19 virus, so I missed our usual question and answer time the month of November and then uh, December with all of the uh, kind of the hustle and bustle of that season and uh, the way things kind of get uh, rearranged and disarranged because of the holiday season. We missed out on that as well. So we're back in January, the first month of this new year. And let's look again this fourth Sunday night at some questions and answers. Some wonderful questions have been submitted again. I think there are about four tonight. So those of you that have been here before, you know you have to buckle up uh, and uh, get ready. So here we go. Luke chapter 8. Verses 16 to 18, just explain that for us. And that's a good passage to certainly explore. You can make an entire lesson out of it, but we'll try to give you five or seven minutes about it. Jesus is speaking, and here's the statements that he makes in this particular passage. No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sits it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known and come to light. Therefore... Take heed how you hear, for whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. Well, as always, anytime you're studying any Bible question, it's crucial, vital, essential. I don't know of any other word uh, to use, maybe I do, but those are three that, uh, uh, again, make it uh, certain, indispensable, that you take context into consideration. And we want to do that in this passage. In chapter 8, Luke records for us that Jesus, in verse 5, told the familiar parable of the sower. And most of us are acquainted with uh, a very... Uh, well-known account, Jesus using imagery that all of them could have um, probably even at that hour looking around at their outdoor setting watched and witnessed maybe even in live um, sort of terms at that very moment. And you remember that four types of soil are described and the seed responded uh, based on the type of soil in which it was sown or planted. Uh, the disciples wonder about that and says, well, what does that really mean? And Jesus said, well, here's the meaning. And he gives that meaning that seems fairly straightforward, at least to us, because we have the explanation. Maybe we should cut them some slack that they don't uh, grasp it maybe as quickly as we do. Uh, but Jesus says that's the meaning of the parable. Now, uh, Luke adds this kind of as an addition or an addendum to a further explanation then of the parable of the sower. And he said, no one's going to light a lamp and put it uh, under the bed or cover it with a vessel. You might be aware and thinking that this is a parallel to Matthew 5. And it's true in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus uses some similar language and verbiage as this, uh, but it seems that uh, this is a different occasion. Jesus did not give the parable uh, of the sower and the soils, for instance, during the Sermon on the Mount. But it was a familiar way in which he reasoned, it appears, from its appearance here also in Luke chapter 8. What's the point? Well, you light a lamp. That day we just flip a switch. Or today we flip a switch. They would have to light a lamp. And it wasn't a lantern like we're thinking of a Coleman camping lantern or uh, some other kerosene uh, coal oil lamp that some of you are familiar with from your childhood. Uh, but it was just a little ceramic um, almost even just a dish of sorts, even though it might have a little bit of a covering on it, usually fashioned out of a piece of pottery with a little handle on the side. Olive oil would be poured in the reservoir, and then some sort of flammable wick would be inserted, and of course it would then be lit and the oil would burn, and that would be their artificial illumination. A much inferior product for sure to what we enjoy in the modern day. But Jesus says even then, the purpose of lighting a lamp is for the purpose of giving light. And so the lampstand, even in that day, was made to elevate the light so that it might cast its rays and its illumination even farther and dispel more of the darkness. Everyone can see the light. But he says, if you are doing that, 
uh, you're not going to put it somewhere where that light would be diminished. Verse 17 and 18 do seem a bit curious, and I think that's probably what the questioner was really wondering about. What does Jesus mean when he says, Nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will not be known or come to light? Take heed then how you hear. There is the crucial part, verse 18, that explains verse 17. It's not a warning, verse 17, about the exposing of sinful secrets. There are passages in the Word of God that hint at that idea, and we've explored those in actual previous lessons uh, during question and answer time. And we wonder, what about those things? We've all got them, don't we? We don't like to give much thought, but every once in a while they run across our thinking and we go back. You may go back decades. I, I can remember things tonight that I did more than 30 years ago that to my knowledge, no one on the planet knows I did them. The Lord knows. I'm ashamed of them. Some of the things that uh, I did even in my youth. And you may have those same sorts of reservations. You may have something much more recent that you did. Now, if that's the case, don't maybe console yourself with saying, well, if nobody knows, that's okay. No, if there's sin there, you need to eradicate it. You need to repent of it. It may involve even confessing that sin to one to whom you sinned against. If it is between you and God truly alone, then you make it right with Him if you have not yet done that. But what Jesus is here saying, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5 is another uh, passage where it talks about judge nothing until the Lord comes. He'll bring the hidden things of darkness, reveal the counsels of the heart. Then everyone's praise will be from God. In other words, God knows. And that, uh, that reality is stamped on almost every page of Scripture in some form or fashion. The Hebrew writer says everything is naked. That's the word that's used and it's a very uh, poignant one, but it's purposeful. Everything is naked and open with Him with, with whom we have to do. We're not going to hide from God. Jesus, though, is saying here, take heed how you hear. In other words, what I'm telling people, that's the meaning of verse 17, what I'm telling people about the truth will be revealed. Even though men may try to suppress it, even though there are those who will try to distort it, uh, the things that I am communicating, this truth, and even ultimately I think it revolves around his identity. Maybe this is a foreshadowing of even his resurrection. But eventually, uh, even if it only occurs on Judgment Day, truth will be vindicated. Jesus will be shown to be who he claimed to be. And the truth of his word that he demanded men to submit to will be shown to have been exactly what ought to have been done. There are those who deny it who denigrate it. There are those denied who laugh at you and me. They call us foolish and silly. You people are just out of your minds. You think that there's some God. You think that there's some Jesus. You're absurd living that Christian life. And they can say all of that this side of Judgment Day. But on that day, when we stand before the Creator of the universe, He'll also be our Father. And on that day, He will certainly reward those of us who have faithfully served Him. We don't rejoice in the, uh, in the plight of the wicked. We don't rejoice to think that one day they'll find out. One day they're going to get it. We don't rejoice in that. But we do know that God will eventually, in fact, prove, show, and demonstrate that serving Him, living for Him, was well worth it. And that will be the only thing that matters in eternity. So verse 18, take heed how you hear. That's a warning even for us tonight, but it's a warning certainly for all people that have ever been exposed to the gospel, and we want to expose everyone to it. And in those efforts, we need to tell people, this is serious, what I'm sharing with you. Take heed how you hear. Now, to the one who has, more will be given. If I understand and want to understand God's Word, uh, God will help me to do that. But those that uh, have not that desire, even when they think they've acquired some measure of it, that can be taken away. We have to listen to truth properly, in other words, and this is a vital warning. And so Jesus is telling us here, maybe uh, again, just further supplementing how we receive the Word. The Word is sown. What type of soil are you? And we certainly want to be that good ground that has a willing, noble, and uh, an open, honest heart that receives God's Word and allows it by our response to it to bear proper fruit in our lives. So I hope that's helpful. As always, further clarification is needed, then certainly feel free to ask. Question two tonight, what are some biblical principles to guide our giving to religious organizations? And then the questioner put in parentheses some options. For instance, the Shriners. 
you're not familiar with that organization, uh, they are a religious or have a religious component to their organization. Likewise, the Salvation Army and Samaritan's Purse. Now, the picture that you see on screen, the lady on the right in the orange shirt, that's what her shirt says, Samaritan's Purse. That is a, a relief organization of sorts. Uh, it's similar to uh, organizations even that we as the Lord's people try to utilize in disaster relief efforts, but uh, it's involved uh, especially, of course, the name Billy Graham is recognizable to most, and as I understand it, maybe at least some in his organization uh, had a part in starting and still maintaining uh, that particular organization. This was a picture taken in Cookville after the tornadoes back in March. So what are some principles uh, that guide us in giving to organizations like that that have a religious component to them, if you will. And then the second question is, can we receive the help that they provide? Now, they're two separate questions. I want to treat them as such. Uh, I'm not going to be able tonight to look at every organization and look at all of their religious beliefs or leanings. I would invite you to do that research on your own if you need my help in doing that. I'd be glad to provide it, but that would take uh, the entirety of our time to just do that. But uh, trust me in saying most of you know there are some religious components to at least these three particular organizations and others. Well, uh, let's think about giving just more generally in a broad way and then try to, if you will, funnel it down. Acts 20 verse 35, Jesus told us something about giving, you remember. Paul said, labor, work hard, remember the weak. That's why we work not only to provide for ourselves, that's important. In fact, if we don't, we're worse than unbelievers, he would tell the Thessalonian Christians. And so uh, that's a needed admonition for many even in our world today. And then Paul adds, remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said. Now, here's an interesting little fact. It is more blessed to give than receive. That's what Jesus said, but he didn't say it, at least as recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It must have been something that Jesus said often enough that it was passed down and so common, if you will, uh, that the people realized it. Now, again, Paul's writing by God's Holy Spirit's inspiration, so he's able to say that, but uh, Jesus taught that. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So giving is proper. It's what God wants us to do. And notice this isn't even in an act of worship sort of setting. More generally, no, giving is what God expects. Uh, here's some Old Testament principles. Proverbs 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. There's no qualifiers on that other than it's your enemy. Now, I think the supposition is... If he's not your enemy, then naturally you're going to attend to his needs. But even for those who you might not automatically think, well, I need to help this person. No, even if it's your enemy and he's in need, in this case hunger, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Luke 6 verse 38, Jesus again, speaking of giving in a general way, says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. With the, me with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Those of you not familiar in trading or dealing or selling agricultural commodities might miss what Jesus is talking about. Uh, but a lot of us know what he's talking about. Uh, Jesus might have been well speaking of uh, selling barley or some other grain. I can remember, at least for my family, an uncle in particular, uh, his specialty was green beans. And in a bushel basket, uh, I would sometimes uh, help uh, his wife, my aunt, uh, pick green beans uh, for folks that were coming to pick them up. In that bushel basket, you could fill it up, and I think I have did it. I've done it, and uh, I can go inside where it's cool again, get out of the uh, heat of the garden. He'd say, no, no, that's not enough yet. And you just take that basket and shake it a little bit and kind of press it down. He'd do exactly what Jesus said to do, and it'd be amazing. You'd have to put more green beans in there. What's Jesus saying? Well, be generous. Be abundant uh, in your giving. Don't be a miser. Uh, don't choke George or Abe or Andrew Jackson or whoever you've got in your hand when you're giving it to someone, as it were. Give generously. Give freely. Now, here's some other principles. That's what giving is, and those are just a sample. We're to be generous people. We're to be compassionate people. We're to be loving people. We're to be helpful people in our giving, financially and otherwise. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what our Heavenly Father wants us to do. He's a giver. Let's balance that, though, with Ephesians 5, verse 11, where Scripture says, Have no fellowship. Fellowship is the word in the original language that means participating together or joint participation. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What's an unfruitful work of darkness? A work of darkness as opposed to a work of the light. 
darkness and light contrasted in Scripture between righteousness and unrighteousness, sin and wickedness usually described as being uh, darkness, even outer darkness, Jesus would use that imagery, light, a representation of God and goodness and holiness and righteousness. So have no joint participation with those, rather expose them. Further, 2 John 10 and 11, that one chapter book, John says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, verse 9 says that, that doctrine he's speaking of is the doctrine of Christ. Primarily that he had come in the flesh, that he was the Son of God, but I think more generally does not bring the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the teaching that accords with Scripture. What do I do, John? Don't receive him or her into your house, nor greet him. Now, we hear that word greeting, that means I can't talk to them at all. No, the word in the original language in that day, greeting involves more. Sharing with them, helping them, furthering their efforts. And verse 11 qualifies that for you. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. That is, if there is one that is doing something contrary to the word of God, I'm not to help him further his efforts in doing that which God has not commanded. Or doing things contrary to what God commanded. It is thus my... Um, suggestion in that regard, and it's my and our family's personal practice as it relates to organizations or charities that have some religious component that is outside of New Testament Christianity, we do not give to those. We do not support those. Uh, and that's in accordance with these principles that I hopefully have outlined for you in this way. Now, the second question is, can I receive help from them? Some would say, if you can't support them, neither can you receive help from them. Let me ask you to consider uh, a few thoughts on that matter. Billy Sunday, not a New Testament Christian, but some of you may recognize his name for preaching in the last uh, century, the first part of it. Uh, he was actually a, professor, a professional baseball player before he became uh, a sort of traveling preacher. Uh, he was an outspoken opponent of prohibition, uh, or he was a proponent of it. He wanted uh, the passage of prohibition, of course, the uh, prohibiting the sale of alcohol in this country. And uh, there were some that tried to buy him off, some of those in the alcohol industry uh, of sorts. And he took their money and people kind of looked at him kind of strangely and they said, well, you can't do that. You're against that. And he said, I'll take the devil's money and I'll wash it in the blood and then spend it on the kingdom. Well, that's kind of a neat little spin on things, but uh, does it match what the scripture teaches? Uh, there is what I believe the Bible teaches about what I'm calling common grace. And there is a misconception of that in the theological world that I won't bore you with tonight as it relates to Calvinism. But here's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44 and 46. Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate, uh, hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father. For He, that's God, God does what? He makes His sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Jesus said that God loves everyone. He causes His sun to rise on all. And what they do with those blessings then, what is what do they do? Well, some of them use it improperly for sure, but some of them uh, can use it uh, even in a way that we might receive good from it. Even they themselves may be producing it might not be good, as it were. Uh, we can accept good from others without knowing the source, and we do it all the time. Uh, tonight, if you're awakened uh, at midnight or 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning by the smell of smoke in your home, and you dial 911 and the uh, fire department dispatches a truck and they're on the scene in just moments and uh, they begin to hook up the hose and to uh, uh, try to extinguish the fire. You don't interview those gentlemen one by one and say, now, wait a minute, I need to know something about what you believe about Jesus. I need to ask, uh, are you a follower of the word of God? You're not going to do that, are you? I doubt it very seriously. You're going to help them uh, in any way, probably by just getting out of their way. And hopefully they're able to quickly extinguish uh, the problem. And you're thankful beyond measure. You've accepted good without knowing the source from which it came. You are accepting good even with the way in which they are uh, equipped uh, from even uh, monies and funds uh, that were... Uh, gained from the dispersion of the government at every level, both local, uh, state, federal, and otherwise, uh, from taxes on activities and products that are not good. It's just a fact of the matter. And you accepted good without knowing its source. Further, let me ask you to consider, and there are four of those here, and I'm just putting them up there. If you want to uh, study these more, I'm not going to read each of these passages in detail. Uh, 
But what you will see is that even in the Word of God, there were occasions where God's people received good from those who were not God's people. And um, there are these examples, and maybe there are more. Moses, in Exodus 12, verses 25 to 36, tells the children of Israel, we're leaving Egypt. God said it, so it's happening. As you go, though, take uh, the gold and the other goods that your Egyptian neighbors will give you. And they did. And they later used those in a variety of ways, some of them even fashioning vessels, probably for the service of God in the tabernacle and otherwise. Solomon, in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 13 to 16, uh, makes a kind of partnership with Hiram, the king of Tyre. Now, we don't know everything that we'd like to know about that man. Apparently, he had some relationship with Solomon's father, David. Uh, some even suggest that he was, at least in some capacity, a believer in the true God. Uh, but again, he is outside, it seems, uh, the chosen race, outside of the descendants of Abraham. But Solomon receives good from him in the form of timber and other supplies, craftsmen to help work on the temple. And uh, they do that in the magnificent temple for worship of God is constructed. Nehemiah that we talked about last Sunday morning in Nehemiah chapter 2, ask Artaxerxes, uh, the Persian monarch. Uh, he asked him for permission and for goods to go back and again rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Earlier, Zerubbabel had, by foreign assistance, went back uh, to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. And uh, here's an interesting one. In Luke chapter 8, I will invite you to read uh, that passage with me. We were there earlier. If you go back to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, Jesus is preaching. He's going through uh, the various regions there. The Bible says the twelve were with him. Verse 2 now, certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom he had come seven demons. And listen to this, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. And Susanna and many others who provided from him for him from their substance. I am inferring some things here. I'll make that admission. Joanna, though, is listed as the wife of Chusa. He is named because of his title and his position. He is Herod's steward. What that role involved, we don't know, but it must have been one at least of some prominence. Joanna, like most women in the first century, would not have had means of her own outside of her home uh, to make money. It seems at least to the measure where she would have been able to have access to support uh, this work as she was doing in this case with the ministry of Jesus. Did Jesus refuse her help because of where it came from? Now, if you know anything about Herod, he's a political tyrant. Uh, he's immoral. Now, he is the Jewish figurehead. He only has power because Rome grants it to him. He's vile. He's wicked. He's unethical. He's unjust. Uh, you could just uh, heap up the adjectives describing what a bad guy he was. And Joanna here is getting money from her husband's employment under that, uh, that sort of man. And Jesus allows and accepts that assistance, it seems, uh, to help him meet the needs of his disciples, just the common everyday needs, maybe uh, to pay for meals and other things. We're not sure of all of it. But what it seems to me is that, uh, can I accept, uh, that's the original question going back, organizations, and here the picture on screen, I don't mean any disrespect by it, but uh, the Shriners in particular uh, is one that I'm more familiar with. We have had family members who have utilized their services uh, because they do a great deal uh, with children who have uh, crippling, sometimes birth defects, sometimes other injuries. Uh, sometimes there's uh, injuries related to uh, fires and things of that nature. And uh, they make it possible for those children to receive health care that maybe otherwise they wouldn't. Can I accept that? Yes. I think it's a common grace of God. It's uh, something that God is providing for uh, people, even through those who may be opposed to him otherwise in certain realms. Uh, is it a complicated issue? It can be. Uh, I'm not denying that fact at all. But maybe just some of these thoughts will be helpful to you in working through those things this evening. Question number three. Oh, you got to love Facebook, don't you? You love when that pops up. Well, here's the Facebook uh, question. Why do, and someone was putting this out there, modern versions of the Bible leave out verses that the King James Version and the New King James Version include? Here's the actual Facebook post, if you want to see it, that the person shared with me and they wanted me to respond to it. I didn't on Facebook. Uh, maybe there will be a time for that sometime else, but I'm just going to read it. Uh, he puts very critical alert. The NIV was published by Zondervan, Zondervan's the publishing house, but is now owned by Harper Collins, another publishing house, who also punishes the Satanic Bible. 
And so the NIV and the ESV and various other versions have now removed 64,575 words from the Bible, including Jehovah, Calvary, Holy Ghost, and Omnipotent, name but a few. They have also removed 45 complete verses. Try and find these scriptures on your computer, phone, or your device right now if you are in doubt. And he lists them. Matthew 17, 21, Matthew 18, 11, Matthew 23, 14, Mark 7, 16, 9, 44, 9, 46, Luke 17, 36, 23, 17, John 5, 4, Acts 8, 37. You will not believe your eyes. Are all of those verses missing in those uh, online versions or even in some of your hardback versions? In those uh, versions outside the King James, the New King James Version? Yes, they are. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Uh, the guy goes on that's making the post, refuse to be blinded by Satan and don't act like you just don't care. Let's not forget what the Lord Jesus said in John 10, 10, King James Version. There is a crusade geared towards altering the Bible as we know it. The NIV, the ESV, and many modern versions are affected. The solution, if you must use the NIV and the ESV, buy and keep an earlier version of the Bible. A hard copy cannot be updated. All these changes occur when they ask you to update the app on your phone or laptop, etc. Please spread the word of this very critical alert. I read that a little bit sarcastically because the person making the post is terribly ignorant about several different matters. I'm not questioning their sincerity whatsoever, but um, if they look even in their hard copies from the very first edition of any of these versions that they've mentioned, these same verses are missing then. One of them dating back to 1973. It's not because of an update in technology. It's not because one publishing house has been sold to another or not. There are verses that uh, if you have a version outside of these two, if you turn and read, uh, even as you did tonight with the reading, uh, for instance, uh, you would notice that there was a verse missing, as it were. Why is that the case? Well, it relates to what we call textual criticism. And this would take all night, but I'm going to give you the uh, quick uh, three or four minute answer. Uh, the Textus Receptus, which is just Latin for received text, it just sounds fancier if you say Textus Receptus, uh, was the Greek text of the New Testament used by Erasmus. Well, who is Erasmus? Uh, Erasmus is the guy that uh, was a monk who kind of put all these things together. Um, his actual religious leanings are a matter of some scholarship debate. Uh, he used eight old Greek copies to make his one Greek text that became known as this received text, which was the Greek uh, text that was used by the King James Version translators in 1611. Now, when I say he used old Greek copies, I put that in quotation marks because at the time, uh, limited work in archaeology and other things had been done. Remember when we're talking about the Bible, the Holy Spirit did not inspire these men and they wrote it and they sent it to the publisher and they had a million copies that were just like the original. They were handwritten copies and they were sent. When Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he wrote one letter and he sent it to them. If they wanted it to share, they had to write it, meticulously copy it word for word by hand. And that's the way it happened until Gutenberg's printing press uh, more than 1400 years later. What we are trying to do then is to take all of the copies of the copies of the copies of the copies that we have of God's Word and try to see how far back can we go to get closer to the original, what are called the autographs. Now, none of the autographs, none of the original writings survive. There's not an original of Romans, of Matthew, of John. None of those survive, but we do have copies. Now, when Erasmus formulated his text that was used, he used eight old copies and he kind of combined them to see what he thought was best into one. Archaeological advances and discoveries since that time, since uh, the late 1500s, early 1600s have advanced so that now we have over 6,000 copies, some full, some partial, uh, some only very small fragments of the New Testament in Koine Greek, the original language that the writers wrote in. All of that helps us get closer to what we call the original autographs. And this is an entire branch of study. And uh, it's a fascinating study. I would have liked it, but it made my eyes go cross. My poor eyesight uh, trying to read uh, these ancient manuscripts. But it, it's a fascinating study. And there are men uh, and women who have given their lives uh, to this sort of study, and I appreciate it. What I'm telling you is when you pick up, for instance, one version, and you read it, and you can see, well, it's in that version, but a newer, 
uh, version may not have it, don't automatically assume that the modern or newer version is trying to destroy the Bible. That's not what they're doing at all. They're trying to see where there could have been a copyist error, for instance. They're trying to see where there is something that is there uh, that could have been included, again, unintentionally. And uh, anytime we say things like this, people, you know, they kind of get on edge and they're kind of uh, worried. Are you saying the Bible's not trustworthy? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, I'm saying that uh, we can understand that as men made copies and copies and copies, it is natural. Just uh, you try it sometime. You just take a page of scripture and you copy it by hand. And then you go back or ask someone else and see if even you make a copy that is without error. I would doubt that you would even succeed at doing that as would I in some way or another. And uh, there are a lot of good resources available if you want to learn more about this. And it's something that we don't need to be upset about. We don't need to get angry. We don't need to uh, try to pit this group against that group and say, well, this has to be this way. And uh, if you don't do it this way, you're not pleasing in the sight of God. It's just not worth that sort of uh, foolishness. And I'll call it that because that's, in my opinion, what it is. If we are ignorant of what uh, actually transpired and how this book was delivered to us. If you want two good resources, they're downstairs in the library. One is called How We Got the Bible. And uh, you can find it. It's only about 150 pages. It's a fairly good, uh, simple read and more technical work. It's called From KJV to NIV by Dr. Jack Lewis. It's also uh, downstairs in the library. I think it's about 400 pages. It's much more detailed if you want to get uh, really deep into the bushes to understand this question. Uh, but when you see things like this and you say people are trying to destroy the Bible, they're taking verses out of the Bible, that's not what's happening at all. And again, if the questioner wants a further explanation, Maybe even more simple than what I've given now. I'll be happy to try to provide it. Last question for tonight. Isn't this a little relevant? What does 1 Timothy 2 verse 2 quiet and peaceable life mean? Now, the questioner actually asks a series of other things, but I'm just kind of bowling it down uh, to that. And unless you've lived in a cave or under a rock or somewhere else over the last few weeks, uh, you know this is a very needed uh, thing to think about. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, that we are to live a quiet and peaceable life. What are we to do uh, now, as it were, that one administration has been replaced uh, by another? Well, let's just read 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, let's just read uh, verses 1 to 4, because that's the unit, I think, that Paul put these verses together for our learning. He said, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The contention is, and this has been expressed widely, especially on social media, that because of a change in our government's administration, uh, that supposedly uh, the current administration now in power replacing the previous one is more antagonistic toward Christianity and godly morality. Is that true? I'm going to qualify it simply by saying being noncommittal, possibly. There are certainly policies that appear uh, from what those who uh, have advocated and did succeed at uh, winning and replacing the previous administration with the new one now uh, that made promises and assurances uh, to certain groups uh, as it regards uh, abortion especially that are out of bounds in what the Word of God teaches. There's just no other way to say it than that. And even executive actions that have been taken, I understand already very early uh, in this new presidency, indicates that they are making good on those promises, and that's heartbreaking for those who love the Word of God and love uh, life that He gives us. What do we do, though, in response? Uh, that's kind of what the questioner was really wanting us to know, and it's a question that's very relevant. Uh, today, I don't know if any of you would be uh, any way uh, affiliated with this gentleman. His name is, I, I think it would be Stefane, maybe. Uh, he's French. He's a French-Canadian. His last name is Malé. M-A-I-L-I-E with one of those little squiggly things, E-T. He's been to polishing the pulpit. He preaches in New Brunswick, Canada. This afternoon, he said, while preaching, law enforcement authorities entered their church building. Someone had called in that they were meeting and assembling. 
Canada is under a strict COVID lockdown, permitting no assemblies at all of more than, I guess, 10 people. And um, he said the law enforcement authorities were very kind. They were very professional. But they said, you will now disperse and dismiss or be uh, taken to jail and fined additionally. And he said, we complied. Now, he didn't indicate what they were going to do next week. And I don't know really what, um, you know, that situation, how it will develop. I don't know. But people say, well, that's where we're headed. Perhaps. I don't know. What can we do in those sorts of instances? Let's read again. Maybe you have your Bible still open there. We pray that we would lead a quiet and peaceable life. Who do we pray for? We pray for kings and all who are in authority. Now, uh, two or one rather uh, excellent article and thoughts on this matter because he uh, is very aware, as I've expressed to you, of those raising questions about this came from Brother Steve Higginbotham's pen. Those of you uh, that subscribe to his email uh, list, you may have received this or seen it otherwise. Uh, he also put it on his Facebook page, Do You Know These Men? And he just had a, a picture, and you can tell they're kind of historical looking pictures of two individuals. And then he said, Do you know there was once a nation whose leader was known for? And he begins to list. And I can't read to you tonight. I don't want to read to you tonight publicly what these men were known for because the last time I did, some of you complained. Because when we went over the book of Romans in chapter 1 and the catalog of sins, do you remember what I told you some of the Roman emperors were doing in that day? I told you about them murdering children. I told you about them watching, making parents watch as they did it. I told you about their sexual immorality. Some of you said, I don't want to hear that. That's gross. That's despicable. That's wicked. That's nauseating. That, that's just, that shouldn't be said in a public set. And I agree in some measure. But that's what those Christians in the first century were facing. Tiberius, Caligula, Nero, Domitian, all of their names. In addition to all of that, in addition to that, they persecuted God's people. Nero's favorite tactic was just to behead Christians, to dip the severed head in tar, and then to light it, put it on a pole, as it were, and use it like a candle to illuminate the streets of Rome. That's sick, isn't it? That's gross. That's terrible. That was the fate of our Christian brothers and sisters in the first century. Brother Steve, I can read you this part. Instead, what did uh, he said, what you may not know is that according to Scripture, neither Jesus nor Paul nor any other Bible writer called for governmental reform. The ouster of Tiberius or Caligula or Domitian or Nero, no opposition or trying to raise a party that would replace them, no willingness on the part of Christians to engage in political activism. Instead, what did Jesus and Paul do? They said to preach righteousness, condemn unrighteousness, pray for boldness and peace, and so that we would live a quiet and peaceable life. And then he ends in this way, my prayer is that God's people will be known for, one, being more vocal about Jesus than our presidential candidate, two, being more passionate about the success of the church than the success of our nation, and three, being more moved to action by the gospel than by a political platform. And to that I would say amen. Back in November when we talked about this matter, even before the election, you remember my emphasis was simple. God rules in the kingdoms of men. Does that mean that he approves of or endorses everything that men do as leaders in kingdoms and in governments? No, that's not what I intended to convey. And I gave you that qualifier then. God hates unrighteousness wherever it may appear in whatever form. Whether in the highest office in the land or the lowest hovel in the land. But he rules and he's in power and he's in control. And when we violate his will... Uh, then we are punished for it. When we do as he says, then we are rewarded for it. Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. And the danger that I gave you then, I'll give you again tonight, be aware of what might be called political idolatry. I know there are probably 
so many people not intending to convey what it seems that they are actually conveying by some of their words. And I've seen this, especially in a social media uh, sort of setting in that platform. I've seen uh, those that I know that are faithful Christians who say, we have no hope now. I've seen more than one make a statement like that, exact wording or very similar to it. We have no hope now. Is that really true? I, I never read in this book that we only have hope when a certain party uh, is in power. It's not what this book says. Colossians 1 verse 27, Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, hope does not disappoint. We have hope. It doesn't matter who lives in this big white house at Pennsylvania Avenue. Further, I've seen people say, uh, you know, that we need to, uh, we don't have any mechanism whereby to affect change. And that's said in various ways. Have we forgotten that prayer is still a powerful mechanism for change? Uh, there's another article, and I won't take time to read it tonight. If you'd like a copy of it, I'll be glad to share it with you. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Brown, and I have no idea uh, who he is whatsoever. But uh, he wrote an article uh, entitled, Why uh, the Current Presidency Could Be Good for the Church. I think he's using church in the most broad uh, sort of sense. He's not talking about just New Testament Christianity. But I like what he has to say. And in essence, if I'll take these three pages, I'll condense it down to two or three sentences. Here's what he says. He said, now light and darkness, they're seen for what they are or might be. Now the decision over whether or not to serve the Lord is not something that can be made without maybe some consequence or ramification. Maybe now's the time where we have to be serious and we'll be forced, as it were, to be serious about what we really believe about what God's Word says. If that means persecution, if that means opposition, if that means exclusion or whatever. If we are going to be committed to the Lord in the way that He wants us to be committed, then maybe even in these times of adversity, uh, that will be well worth it. It may be God's intention all along. I don't know. It's certainly something to ponder. So what do we do? What does it mean to live a quiet and peaceable life? Well, it means we do these things. It's about the best that I can do. It means we keep loving God and serving God. Nothing's changed because one party came into power and another maybe exited power. We're going to keep loving God and serving God, no matter what, no matter the cost. We're going to love people and serve people. And if we want to affect change, we don't shout at them. We don't uh, try to merely change their political beliefs. I think that's probably where uh, we went wrong in a lot of other ways. We convince them that they need to love God and serve God by loving them and serving them. And then we do exactly what Paul said to do here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. We pray and we pray and we pray and we pray. And again, just showing you the folly, not to pick on anyone, but the folly of how this thinking can be so convoluted. Uh, I watched as one person made the comment, they said, well... Once, I didn't have to pray for the president because I know he'd do the right thing. Now I've got to start praying again. I just shake my head in amazement at something like that. Paul didn't say, you know, just pray for him if you think he agrees with you or if you think even he agrees with what God would have him or her to do, whatever position of power they may be in or authority given. Pray, supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. It's my desire, and I know it's yours, that we would lead lives that are quiet and peaceable. I would love that interference from any source, governmental or otherwise, would be non-existent and continue to be so. Will it be? I know not. I pray for the strength that God will give us simply to do His will to love Him, and to love people. And I encourage you to pray the same. Tonight, the greatest question that uh, can be asked of anyone is, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to bring my life into the harmony of the will of God? Most of us have answered that question tonight, but by chance, if you've not, then please consider uh, the steps that the New Testament outlines. Hearing and believing that Jesus is the Son of God and the answer for your sin is essential. That's what you must do. But acting upon that belief and knowledge that you gain from hearing God's Word will lead you then with that understanding to desire to serve Him. To serve Jesus Christ, you have to turn away from sin. To serve God the Father, you have to submit to His will and not your own. 
repentance you do that and turn your life toward Him. Uh, further, you make that desire known by confessing your faith, admitting and uh, telling all who will hear that you believe He is God's Son and you're going to commit your life to Him accordingly. And then you're baptized, enter in to be placed in Christ. There's no better place to be. Uh, and that's not confined to a geographical location. That's a spiritual place. You're placed in Christ. When you're baptized, your sins are washed away as you contact the precious blood He shed in His death. And then live faithfully. Uh, that is essential for all of us to do. And as we continue to study this book, questions will arise and we'll have uh, things that we wonder, how do I do this and how do I do that? But we continue to humbly walk with Him, walk in the light as He is in the light, and fellowship with Him continues and as His people were forgiven. If tonight you're His child and not walking in that light like you know you should, then this, again, is the wonderful time for you to make that right. We'll help you in any way that we can. Please make that known to us and come, if you're willing, as we stand and sing together. Oh, dear Lord.